So welcome to the pre-recording of lecture 36. Um, this is the second part of session 18 of the eight week summer course. Uh, so it's the beginning of the seventh week, the next to last week. So the session of today is mainly showcasing more elaborate applications um, kind of in preparation for our last project so i will demonstrate the application of python to make an animation for the game of life uh, the game of life will be developed in two stages so there is like in the previous lecture we had the algorithmic difficulty uh, that will be hidden in a function um, so the game of life is implemented by a couple of functions uh, stored in a module the graphical user interface is really an interface on top of that uh, module okay um, so let's uh, perhaps run this um, so let me go to the terminal window and let me do live.py um, so what you see here now is the uh, GUI and perhaps I should have made it larger uh, but it has a canvas uh, a scale to control the speed and a start button so I'm pressing the start button now. So that launches uh, the GUI. And uh, you see the granularity, also my resolution. I have actually large blocks uh, for the simulation. Uh, you see um, there is uh, some movement. Uh, there are some sliders. But now uh, what you have is we have blinkers. So let me run this game again. So I will restart. So it starts with a random grid. And then you see uh, some blinkers occurring, some blocks where nothing is happening. Sometimes the blocks are eaten up uh, by sliders. Um, so this game of life uh, is defined by relatively simple rules, uh, but you can already have uh, complicated uh, and interesting patterns happening even for a very small uh, simulation like this one. So at the end, uh, things seem to be always converging to blinkers or either blocks, but uh, there is still life happening. So the point is that Python is a high productivity language. It will uh, take essentially very relatively little code uh, to build this. Um, it's an illustration of the Kinter, also an illustration to working with two-dimensional tables, um, tables of numbers. So that will be the main difficulty in implementing this correctly. Okay, um, so let me stop the animation and also stop the window. So there are two parts in this lecture. In the slide presentation, I will present uh, the rules and then also the design decisions that are made and that are leading to the implementation. So the game of life is attributed to the mathematician John Conway. Um, we have a rectangular grid of squares. In every square, uh, there can be a living cell or not. In the animation that I showed, if a white cell had no life, a green cell was a living cell. And then uh, there are the following rules. Uh, if there are three live neighbors to an empty cell, then that cell comes alive. Then a living cell can either die or survive. It can die by loneliness if there are no neighbors or only one neighbor. 
it can also die by overpopulation. So a cell in the middle uh, has can have eight uh, neighbors. So there are so there is a three by three block of nine cells. The center cell is the current cell where you look at. If there are more than four four or more uh, cells that have life in them, then there is overpopulation. If the cell has only two or three neighbors, then the cell survives. So we will code up these rules in one function. So in a way, this is very much a functional design. Once you define the data structure, uh, the grid is essentially a matrix or a two-dimensional table of zeros and ones. Here is early in the game, and then we have the formation of patterns. Um, so there are entire fields of study dedicated to this. Here uh, I'm using this as a very standard um, application of uh, an animation, a canvas, a start and a stop button. And then there is also one scale to control the speed at which the canvas is refreshed. So we have covered all the elements already. So in a way, you could see this as an exercise already. Uh, we have covered in this course all the tools to implement this. This serves as more a design uh, ex example as well. OK, um, cellular automata. So here are some of the uh, patterns that are occurring so you can have a glider in the game so here I have shown uh, the evolution so from board to board so these are five different states so each time we apply the rules and we update uh, the board all at once um, we will do this here in a very plain uh, definition. So in Python, it's actually quite inefficient. And with vectorization, but that's another course, we can make this a lot more efficient. Um, um, so Stephen Wolfram wrote an entire book on how to work uh, with cellular automata. So not only the game of life with these simple rules, but you can... Uh, compute uh, with these rules. So this is rule-based computing and actually do some very interesting uh, science. This is just to indicate uh, that this belongs to a much larger uh, field. In this course, we are only interested in getting a plain basic simulation out. All right, um, so there are two elements here. Um, implementing the rules on a rectangular grid and then getting the animation to work. Um, so there will be a modular implementation. Uh, so the graphical interface is actually really an interface. It's an other layer on top of the module. So the first, so there are two programs, two scripts uh, corresponding in this lecture. The first script is a collection of functions. Uh, the main program runs the game in a terminal window. Perhaps I should uh, show this. So there is the other script, game.py, uh, 10 rows, 10 columns. Um, so although here you might be uh, probably more inclined uh, to use, so I will use 20 rows and 60 columns. So here you see the grid, the first initial state. There is no life in a cell when there is a zero. There is life when there is a one. I put a space in between. You can more work more compactly if um, you put the zeros and the one without the space. But every time when I um, click yes, uh, you can see the um, evolution. 
Now, why is this useful? Uh, well, this is useful for checking the correctness by visual inspection. So you see in going from state 7 to state 8, there is this uh, first one that we see in the top um, in the top left. Uh, there's only one live neighbor. So this cell actually dies by loneliness. And also the neighbor, uh, they are only two neighbors, uh, so they are, are both dying of loneliness. Uh, there are surviving cells, so here there's one cell that survives that has two neighbors, but then the neighbors are dying out, so in the next stage that will uh, disappear. Here you see cells which are, have three neighbors, so there is a zero and three ones on this, so there will be a one coming there. So you can use this actually rather boring program to see the transitions and going from state to state. So that is the usefulness um, of the first program. Okay, um, then how do we represent the, um, the grid? I was thinking of a matrix. I was actually already talking about the matrix. And in an earlier uh, representation, in an earlier run of the course, I was indeed using NumPy. Uh, but then actually NumPy is not proper part of um, Python. And in subsequent runs of the course, um, I felt that we should be focusing on Python proper, understanding everything that is in Python. Uh, is already uh, too much for one single course. So in Python, you can work with lists of lists. Uh, so every list in the list is a row in the grid. Um, so every row is a list of Booleans now. Um, so you can uh, work with true or false. Uh, so here you make a row of five numbers that are false, no life in there. And here you make uh, Two, every row has two elements and three rows. So in uh, thinking about this double loop, uh, the outer um, for loop in the list comprehension defines the number of rows. Inside the inner one, uh, the inner loop runs over the columns. Um, so there is a typical um, double loop for every row we print every element. So this is, an, we talked about complexity earlier on. So this is where you have a typical quadratic complexity. Um, here, list comprehensions, how useful they are. Uh, so for uh, printing, instead of true and false, uh, a zero and one um, in the decimal format of a Boolean is so much better. Here is the terminal. Uh, approach. Um, this is just to give the specification of the game. So uh, that script is a top-down design. Uh, so here is the main program. You initialize a random grid and you print it already. So uh, in Developing programs execute early and often uh, tests. Um, so do not wait till you have the neighbors done. Then you do the computation of the neighbors. Uh, you also print out. Uh, so it would be very good to actually print out all the neighbors, but because there can be errors there. So you have to compute for every cell how many neighbors there are. Uh, but then you also have to apply the rules, uh, depending on the number of neighbors. Uh, so it's good to test these things separately. Uh, this is not an object-oriented design, uh, although in the GUI we will work with objects. You can import the game and then do game dot. So it's actually the game uh, that will be responsible for the encapsulation of the grid. So that is uh, somehow important as well. So the game, if we import it as 
on the last line on the slide, then we do game dot whatever function. So in some sense, you are kind of simulating object-oriented programming, but it is modular programming. All right, here are the rules to count uh, the uh, live neighbors. Um, so we have nine cells and the current cell is IJ, so row I column J. And we are computing um, going to the upper, uh, to the left and to the right. And each time counting if there is something in there. So that's the reason why if uh, true or false, why working with booleans is a little bit more convenient than working with integers. Um, at the lower level, if you would be interested in working with huge grids and large uh, simulations, then actually you might be concerned as well that you store the grid as compactly as possible. So with true and false, you could actually work with um, with bits. And essentially, if you would work with uh, integers, you would have a four byte integer is 32 bits. So actually with uh, one integer, you could actually store 32 uh, cells. Um, so with a 64 bit integer, you can store 64 uh, cells. Um, so this is uh, these are interesting consider considerations as far as the efficiency goes. But we are just here for prototyping. Uh, the reason why this is interesting is that you have these uh, eight tests that you need to do. But then one needs to be careful. So this is um, for a cell i j which is not on the border. Uh, so this will work if i and j are both positive, not zero. And if they are uh, less than, if j is less than the number of columns, a minus one, and i is less than the number of rows, minus one. So we are not at the last row, we are not at the last column. So there will be a lot of if tests and ifs that are nested. All right, uh, then the GUI, uh, I showed it already. So when we work with the GUI, we have to define the layout. Um, so there is a canvas, central. Then there is a scale that uh, allows to uh, adjust the speed of the drawing. Eventually you could also use that to verify the correctness. If you see something suspicious, uh, then decrease the refreshing rate. So um, there are there is then there are then the two buttons on the GUI. Um, so the uh, buttons actually control uh, the state of the GUI, start or stop. The canvas number of rows, number of columns, and then also we didn't think about this when we were thinking about the rules of the game. We have to think about uh, how big every cell is. Uh, so what is the size of each green square of a live uh, cell? Um, it's good that we actually uh, do first the rules of the neighbors and then do the mapping. Um, so the, the the canvas coordinates are such that the origin is not at the bottom left as we would expect it, but actually also it is as we would print out the grid to screen. So when we print to screen, we start with row zero, entire row zero, entire row one. So the canvas coordinates are actually not that different from printing um, a, a table of numbers to screen. So the table, the number that is at position zero, zero, first row, first column is at the top left. So that is the number that is actually printed out first. So then I mentioned the state. As long as the state is true, we will update the grid. Uh, wipe actually the canvas clean and then 
when after we have updated uh, we will actually wait uh, to refresh so wait to uh, wipe out and uh, show the next state okay um, here is the summary of the design uh, we follow an incremental modular design in some sense we want to get quite quick with the computation of the rules and we want to test this out before before we get into the actual visualization so when we are thinking about the visualization it's then actually an interface uh, we no longer need to be concerned or we no longer need to worry about bugs in our code uh, so in the lectures that are following, uh, we will um, we will work with other simulations, and we will introduce threading. Uh, so here, uh, the cells are following rules. Uh, they come alive, they die, or they survive. Um, so we actually it is the grid, the rules that determine them. Uh, but it would be quite hard to actually introduce randomness in some sense, give some individual autonomy to the cells based on specific characteristics and data attributes of all the cells. All right, there are more exercises here. Most of the exercises um, allow that the... Um, uh, change actually the um, simulation uh, so in a better uh, game of life you have the donut topology uh, so here uh, the number of neighbors so there is the, the the grid is kind of representing a box so if you are at the edge of a box you are stuck there but you can imagine that there is a donut topology or you are the the are living on a sphere so there is actually no boundary so if you are at the left row and you go to row minus one you actually go to the um, uh, last column so in some sense try to implement this um, so modify the function neighbors um, also, it would be good to really, uh, instead of working with uh, a collection of modules, uh, use the functions as methods in a class game. So there is then, uh, so the advantage is then with all the functions, we need to pass the grid. The grid then becomes uh, a data attribute of the game itself. It's not just any more a list of lists the methods actually are then uh, it's still a list of lists it, it, sorry but uh, it, it's not m any more passed as uh, an argument of all the methods all right there are more exercises so this is to compensate that there were only two exercises in the first half in the previous lecture so um, you can uh, have an entry widget that kind of displays the number of life cells in each stage. Uh, this is simple to compute. So we have the sum method. We can sum all the elements in a list and in a list comprehension do the sum on all the lists. Um, you can also use the lists of integers um, and you can actually uh, encode more information there so you can actually uh, encode a, a, a positive number there and see how long it actually survives uh, this would allow to uh, give actually more statistics uh, so you have the number of life cells in each stage but you could also start to record how long on average does a cell live um, you can add more graphical features so whenever there is a newborn cell color it in red uh, surviving cells are green um, so that also gives somehow the vitality of the uh, application
and then there is the initialization of the game so you could i do this here with a random grid but you could start with gliders uh, so uh, and if you are even more interested in this there is literature about this there are all kinds of pictures that you can make uh, with these very simple rules Okay, a glider then, if you combine this with the donut topology, then your, if you have a glider, and if there's one glider or a sequence of gliders, then actually your animation will never get stuck in blinkers or these kind of uh, dead blocks. Uh, you will actually always see uh, the glider moving along your screen. Okay, um, that was the first part um, in half of the lecture. Let me now go to the Jupyter notebook that I have prepared. So there are several parts, three parts. Uh, I will um, talk about the choice of the data structure. So there are two modules, essentially two programs that are uh, presented, but all the code is actually also contained in this Jupyter notebook which has the advantage that um, I can document. So here are the rules again uh, for the game of life. Uh, the game of life uh, has the bird rule, the first rule. And then for a living cell, um, the cell can either die. So there are two rules to die, overpopulation or loneliness, or it can survive. Um, so I will present this so that's why integers are probably uh, the first uh, data structure you may think about uh, so here let me run this i will make a random grid and here you see the grid uh, the string representation of a list of lists um, so this is already quite good um, but we want to make it slightly better uh, so here you see the double loop. Um, I get to show uh, the I and the J. Also, the end here is not a new line, but is replaced by a space. So that's how I get after every number, I write a space. And uh, when I'm done with the row, I'm running through all 10 columns. I print, uh, I have an empty print, but the print is not empty it will actually print the new line. By default, the end is the new line symbol. Okay, that is the basics. Uh, so Jupyter Notebook have the advantage, just like a terminal window with a Python shell in it, that you can try things out, uh, but in a code cell, you can edit if something is wrong. So it would be kind of difficult to write this up. Um, so I can test very simple code snippets. Okay, counting the neighbors. Um, so the first two functions in the first module are making a random grid and then writing the grid. Uh, so in making the grid, I'm converting the 0 and 1 to false or true. And I'm doing this in a combined for loop with the append. Uh, the append is uh, appending uh, the list comprehension to make. Um, so and this was done uh, on screens with a smaller resolution. So there is the backslash here, which is the continuation symbol. I will leave it now in. Um, so um, in some sense, this is still important. Uh, our previous project was on using functions. Something may have gone wrong there uh, that people didn't use functions or didn't use arguments in functions. What to do with functions? Well, here is a good example. Uh, you kind of uh, the code from the previous section so here the writing of the grid is now encapsulated in the writing of the grid. Um, with the documentation string, I'm defining what is the input argument. It's a list of lists of Boolean. And I'm using 0 and 1. Uh, so here the formatting string, it converts the Boolean into the decimal format. Um, 
So let's test this. I have a random grid and then I write uh, the grid. All right, so this is the encapsulation of the code snippets from before. Um, let's now come to the definition of the counting of the neighbors. Uh, so it's a complicated function, but nevertheless, it actually fits within one code cell. So given a grid, uh, it will return the number of life cells uh, next to that i and j. So we have the general case uh, when we are not at the last row, then we, we have a result, the counter. We, when we are not in the first row, then actually we can go up. Uh, so we can go up to the uh, cell that is just above us, of us. But then to go to the left and the right, so the other two neighbors, uh, we have to check whether we are not in the first column and whether we are not in the last column. So there are these guards here. Um, so these extra if tests. Uh, so we have three ifs, and here we have an if within an if. Uh, so uh, Pylant actually was protesting against this. Uh, this is too complicated. Um, but not if we see our application. Now here it is very useful, and in some sense I don't really uh, capable enough to uh, have them both, but here this is what you have to keep in mind. Um, also, if you write this, you would first, for example, define these uh, four, these eight rules, but then you put extra if statements uh, in front of it. Uh, so let me count how many times do, you, do I update. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have eight count statements. Um, so I have also eight tests. So I test uh, above in the row i minus one, i minus one. I test uh, below i plus one, i plus one. And then I test to the left and then I test to the right. I could have organized it differently. Uh, first everything to the left, then everything to the right. And then I had one cell left or two cells to check uh, right above and right below. So this is reasoning on code. Uh, so we have eight neighbors. So the count can never be more than eight. Uh, so we have seen uh, the writing of preconditions and postconditions. Um, so here the precondition is that grid is a list of lists where we have booleans. Uh, so you can actually also encode this condition in an assert uh, with also a list comprehension. Um, uh, then there is the i and the j, uh, which are indexed. So the i and the j, there the i should actually not be more than the number of rows, and the j should not be more than the number of columns. Also, this can be uh, documented, can be asserted, can be documented as the precondition. The postcondition then is that you would uh, recode all the uh, statements here and uh, doing then the asserts, uh, making sure that the count, well, the obvious um, post condition is that the count is between uh, 0 and 8, 0 and 8 included. Okay, um, now this is static code analysis. Um, luckily, uh, it's good to actually uh, test this out. So uh, this is also why the plain uh, terminal interface is so useful. So uh, we have a helper function that writes the number of neighbors. Uh, so this is also encoded in the, um, in the module. Not strictly necessary, but uh, very useful to verify the correctness. So the module is in that sense not 
that complete so there would actually be a test uh, function that actually uh, computes this and uh, verifies uh, the conditions. So the, the computation of the neighbors is very important to ensure the correctness. Uh, so if you cannot compute, uh, so here every, uh, on the second output cell here, every element is actually replacing um, replacing the the so every element actually is a, is replaced by the number of live neighbors so also in uh, a list based or in a matrix oriented uh, algorithm you could actually apply the rules on this matrix uh, so an alternative so in in the update application uh, the a new list of lists will be made and we will go through all the elements one for one but you could actually make this list of lists and then based on that so here you see two and three um, depending on whether there's life or not so you can see here uh, there are too many so this cell here uh, second row second column has six live neighbors and that cell will die uh, so all the cells where you have uh, more than four four or more uh, those cells will actually die um, there can't be any life so in some sense one can apply the rules one after the other uh, so you can first eliminate all the cells where there is too much um, life in there although i mean i'm sorry so the update is done instantaneously all the rules are actually applied instantaneously so this is a continuously evolving game so we are working with time steps but everything happens actually all at once for all the cells at the same time um okay i'm probably over explaining this uh so the, there are two key uh, rules. Um, I'm explaining a functional implementation. <coughs> so the grid is replaced by another grid. So during the running of this program, there is the original grid, which is the argument, and there will be a new grid, here the result, that will be returned. Um, so, and here you see the the rules now so for every row for every column i compute the number of neighbors in that row and column if there is life then there won't be any life anymore is if there is overpopulation or whether the cell is too lonely only one neighbor otherwise the cell will survive so this is if there is life. So this is why the booleans are so good. Uh, otherwise, there is no life. Then there will be life if there are exactly three life neighbors. So we will mark it through. So this is to indicate that in this functional design, there are two copies of the grid. So this ensures also the correctness. Um, so functional design, a top-down design, if you like, also has the um, also the benefits that uh, the concerns, so the difficulties, are actually uh, separated. So in applying the rule, you assume that the neighbors have been computed correctly. <coughs> Functions are supposed to be small, so you could theoretically interlace here the code for the neighbors but that would make the function update way too cumbersome and difficult to debug as well so here you see the update of a grid um, so i had this grid here so actually i should probably have written um, so let me do this so i have the writing of the grid and then the update of the grid 
So in a animation, it's kind of difficult to verify the correctness for every single of those cells. So this is a 10 by 10. So you actually, you would need to do 100 cases. Uh, so that will take some time. But here we can see what happened. Uh, so there was one cell here that survived uh, because it had three live neighbors. But the others, so we had so many neighbors of uh, these cells here, they die because of overpopulation. And there is some birth that is happening. Uh, so we have here a cell. Um, do we have a cell somewhere with three live neighbors? Yes, so here we have a cell, it's one, one, one. So this cell here, um, there is a one coming here. So here you see a bird. Okay, um, then, so that is the first script. Um, the second script, um, this is the graphical user interface and that is defined with the Kinter. I'm importing all the necessary um, widgets and classes that I need from the Kinter. There is a int var that will be associated to the scale. There is the west, east, north, south to make the buttons larger. We need the all to wipe out canvas. Um, so there's one big cell uh, with the entire class definition. Again, uh, if you write your own classes, execute early. As soon as you have part of the constructor, so I would say just go up to the scale. So we covered the scale in great detail. Uh, as soon as you have the scale, you actually um, run it uh, to make sure that you didn't make any uh, syntax errors. So there is the important state of the animation, um, also the parameters, a number of rows, number of columns. This is actually the total number of squares that you will have. Um, there is the state uh, that I said already. There is the grid, which is here an empty list. Um, so when the user doesn't print start, uh, there is uh, nothing there. You could start with, um, a random uh, grid. Uh, I saw the uh, I covered, so we covered uh, the binding of the mouse uh, to canvas. You could actually also allow that the user makes its initial configuration. That would be uh, probably uh, make the GUI extremely useful if you want to make your variations on the gliders. So you can put a glider there and see what happens with other constellations um, and then run the animation each time. All right, uh, the column span to make the buttons uh, here um, sticky, um, west and east, start and stop. Then the drawing of the cells, the animation, uh, the start and the stop. Uh, so you see that the GUI is already very interesting, uh, but it is defined by very few methods. Um, so we have the drawing of the cells. So this draws uh, the rectangle going through the grid. So here again, Boolean, if there is life, then something will happen. Here the typical uh, double loop. So we go over all the rows and for every row we go over all the columns. Uh, when we draw the cells, we actually uh, wipe out the canvas. In the animation, the drawing of the cell is called after a certain delay. So there is this uh, attribute uh, that is controlled by the scale. I should have emphasized this. So there is this int var. That is the delay. Uh, so the um, update for the canvas will happen after a certain delay, so this allows to regulate the speed. Then the start and the stop. The stop is very simple. Uh, the start could eventually also contain the animation, but for symmetric purposes it's typically that you 
uh, call the animate. Uh, the animate will run as long as the stop button is not pressed. See, it's good practice to have relatively few statements in any method. The constructor is often uh, an exception, but you can also break up the constructor with helper functions. Uh, so if your GUI is very complicated, you have you could break up the window into several zones. Uh, you could put all the buttons in one method, um, all the labels in another method if you have many, all the scales, uh, or you could have even one method to put one to define one scale. Having more functions uh, means having more documentation strings, uh, which may seem a nuisance, uh, but documentation strings are very useful to really um, tell what the program is supposed to be doing. Typically, if you don't really know how to write a good documentation string, you don't really know as a programmer what happens. Okay, uh, I ran it, I think. So here is the uh, GUI again. So I will conclude with that. Uh, so let me uh, run it a little bit slower. So here is the evolution of the uh, game of life. So this is another important uh, illustration of an animation. Um, now given as an interface, an interface to a uh, plain terminal-based uh, application. The terminal-based application is still very useful. Uh, so one may be tempted always to start immediately from the interesting programs. But then it's frustrating if you get bogged down to the computation of the neighbors, for example. Um, okay, uh, perhaps I should show the script as well, um, as this is still running. Um, so let me stop it. I have something to say about the script that I probably overlooked. Um, so there is the code in the uh, notebook, but then there is the script uh, live, which is the script that I first ran. Um, there is, this is a hybrid um, design. Um, what is not apparent in the Jupyter notebook is that I had the game dot. So the game is imported here. So this is... Um, now a script, uh, so it's a script live. Uh, this is importing the game. Uh, so, and I have, although I have a list here, uh, the list is actually made uh, when the animation starts. Uh, so I'm actually making a random grid. Um, so calling the function random grid of the game module. When I'm updating the grid, I'm actually calling the update method of the game. So the update function of the game. But you could interpret this as an object-oriented design. So that is one of the exercises. Um, so in the object-oriented version of the first uh, part, you would actually work with a game. And then the game would also store the list of lists. So that would be the major benefit. Uh, here, it is still theoretically possible since the grid is a data attribute. So there is this reference to the list of lists that actually during uh, the manipulation, during the visualization, something bad could happen to the data. And uh, even though all your rules are correct, during the visualization, something could happen uh, because um, there is no information hiding here. Um, so we talked about how you could make data attributes actually hidden to the programs that use it. The previous lecture was about inheritance. Uh, so that would be 
uh, another design where this class essentially inherits from the game. So that would then, uh, with the constructor, we would actually make a random grid. Um, or we would initialize the grid to, say, an empty uh, grid. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, so this 18th session of MCS 260 was essentially introducing not so much, nothing much really new, but mainly emphasizing and enforcing uh, the programming principles that we have covered earlier. Uh, with the goal of preparing ourselves for the last project. Uh, so in this course, we will be able to prototype uh, a simple game or a simple animation.